Thanks very much for the, to the Education Committee and everyone, for Dr. Taylor in particular, for inviting me to come and speak today. Um, I really enjoy the educational aspect of my job, so it's great to have an opportunity to do this and great to see so many familiar and new faces out there today. So without further ado, I'm first going to start out, and I'm going to try really hard not to fall off the stage backwards. Um, I'm going to start out talking about some full diseases and disorders and how we recognize foals that are sick and what we do about them. So we'll first talk about identifying abnormal foals, um, a little bit about what's normal, and then some signs and very basics about common treatments of common abnormalities that we see. So risk factors. Um, dystocia is always a big risk factor for having an abnormal foal. Those foals should be watched extra closely after they're born. Premature delivery as well. Uh, this foal on the right here you can see is very small, short silky hair coat. We'll go into that a little bit later. Red bag delivery, of course, the true emergency. And those foals can do well after they're born or can be extremely sick and require a lot of intensive care. Um, placentitis, a picture of a thickened brown discolored placenta down here. And those foals are more at risk for having, needing more attention. Twins. Obviously a situation we try to avoid, but sometimes it happens, um, and they are very prone to have, have problems. And then maternal illness. So probably the most common thing we see are severe colics, um, and particularly in the late-term um, late pregnant mares um, can lead to problems, but can lead to premature delivery or a sick foal afterwards. History of previous problem full. So if you have a mare that's had a problem in the past, you definitely want to you know, have a little red flag on her and make sure that foal gets watched more closely. So I'm just really quickly going to run through the normal milestones. Probably most of you know these, but I think it's always important to review because if we don't know what normal is, it's hard to pick up on abnormal. So normal foal should have a suckle reflex within five minutes of birth. They should be sitting sternal, typically within 10 minutes, standing within one to two hours nursing within two to three, passing meconium within six hours. And if anyone can actually find me a meconium happens button, I will, I don't know, give you a discount. I just, I love it. But, uh, so they should pass meconium within about six hours of birth. And then urination. So interestingly, there's a, we see a difference between colts and fillies. Um, colts typically urinate for the first time within eight hours, and fillies are a little bit longer, um, and can, it can be normal for it to take up to 12 hours. So I'm going to move on and just talk about my general approach to sick foals. And to me, my sort of minimum database of what I want to do with any sick foal, um, and this will depend a little bit on if I'm looking at the foal on the farm or in the clinic, um, but definitely a thorough physical exam is the most important thing. And I think it's really key to observe the foal from outside the stall before you go in and start manipulating the mare or the foal. Um, and just watch it and see, see what it's doing and if it's acting, behaving normally. And then blood work, um, we typically do a complete blood count, a serum chemistry, fibrinogen and or SAA, an IgG to look at antibodies, and then USG is urine specific gravity. And that's a really easy way to get an um, overview of how well hydrated that foal is. Um, then in the clinic in particular, we use a lot of blood gases that looks at the pH of the foal's blood, and it's something called lactate, which is an overall measure of how well their tissues are being perfused. Um, we use that a lot for monitoring foals and seeing how they're responding to the therapies that we're giving them. Um, so normal foals, that level can be very high, but it should come down quickly. And if that's not happening, it's a good indication that something is wrong. And then if I have any suspicion that a foal has a systemic infection or is septic, then I want to take a blood culture to see if I can actually isolate bacteria from the bloodstream, which can help guide antibiotic treatment later. And that's best done before antibiotics are started. So our typical routine for a foal that comes into the clinic is to um, place a catheter sterile and collect samples of blood from that to do all of these blood tests and to get a culture, and then we start the foal on antibiotics. Um, so there is no, you know, foals are not all the same, to say the least, um, and there is no true, you know, cookbook approach, but 
I do think about my recipe for sick folds because I think there are these five basic things that you really need to keep in mind for any full, um, regardless of how sick they are. Um, and so I think if you keep those five things in mind, it can really help you out. So antibiotics, in, in my opinion, almost any foal that is sick should have antibiotics because they're so at risk for getting septic that you can prevent a lot of um, problems if you start them on antibiotics early. What type depends on how severe the illness is. Nutrition is of utmost importance. So is the foal nursing? Is it able to nurse? Is it nursing adequately to give them enough calories? Uh, hydration, so they typically get their hydration if they're a normal healthy foal from nursing. Um, but if they're not nursing adequately, then they're going to need fluids in addition to calories um, to help keep them hydrated. And then passive immunity. So this is where measuring our IgG levels comes in, um, making sure that they've gotten adequate transfer of maternal antibodies from the mare can help prevent problems down the line. And then I added umbilicus on here because we always need to um, take care of the umbilicus. You know, it is a source of infection. We think that the GI tract and the lungs are also a main route of infection in foals, but we want to be thinking about this umbilicus. And as I'll show you later, some of these foals that have other problems that makes them be down in the stall and recumbent longer than they should be tend to be very prone to secondary umbilical issues because that umbilicus is right on the ground. So I'm just going to talk about briefly about antibiotics. So I said, as I said, they're, in my opinion, indicated for almost every abnormal foal. I kind of rank these in terms of what my level of concern is. If I have mild concern and I want that foal to be covered with antibiotics, but I don't think it's septic yet, then I'm turning to something like just oral SMZs, which is twice a day, or Exceed, which is this long-acting form of Naxel. Um, that we give sub-Q in foals. It's nice and easy, easy to do. Uh, moderate concern, then I, I like Naxel. It's very, very safe. It doesn't harm the kidneys, which is something we worry about. Um, stepping it up a little bit, I'll add in an aminoglycoside, which is amicacin or genomycin. Amicacin provides better coverage uh, to a broader, broader range of bacteria and is a little bit safer for the kidneys. And then severe concern, I'm heading towards the IV antibiotics. So if they have a catheter in, then I'm using either ampicillin or potassium penicillin, which we call K-Pen, um, plus an aminoglycoside. Again, those aminoglycosides are really harmful to the kidneys. So sometimes I'll use a, a cephalosporin, such as cefotaxime, to give broader spectrum. I'm not going to go into this more, but just wanted you guys to be aware of what antibiotics are out there. Nutrition, a normal foal should drink about 20 to 25 percent of their body weight per day. Um, sick foals, though, typically can't tolerate that volume. So if they have a feeding tube in, we're usually not going to be giving them the same volume of milk that they would be getting um, if they were nursing. And a lot of times they'll have some GI dysfunction if they're not systemically healthy and they'll start to have GI issues if you give them that volume of milk. Um, so. What I, I look at this all as percentages of body weight. Um, if they are recumbent and very cold, then I start with a very small amount per day. It is really important for the GI tract to have milk in it. Um, we know that the, the enterocytes, which are the cells that line the GI tract, need uh, local nutrition. So we try to at least get a, a small volume of milk into them, even if they can't tolerate a large amount that's providing all of their calories. So typically, we're feeding them um, via a nasogastric tube. Occasionally, I will use a bottle if they have a very vigorous suckle. But if I'm supplementing, if they are sick enough to require supplementation, then I worry a lot about aspiration pneumonia. Um, and so I want to be really, really careful that that foal is actually able to drink well from a bottle before I, I would use that. So it's a, it's a rare instance that I'll use that. Um, and what we do is start with a small volume and then increase that amount gradually. Um, and if the feeding, we have a feeding tube in, we're checking for reflux or excess fluid building up in the stomach every time we feed them. Because just like adult horses, they can't vomit, so their stomach can get overloaded. Um, in the clinic, I use a lot of IV nutrition, which is called parenteral nutrition. This, I don't think I have a pointer, but the, the white bag is, that's um, total parenteral nutrition. Um, 
and that it contains glucose, lipid or fat, and amino acid or protein. So you've got all three, all three food groups in IV form. And this can be really, really helpful if that foal can't tolerate feeding through the GI tract well. Um, just to talk about dextrose supplementation, so a lot of times we will use dextrose supplementation on the farm, but it's important to be aware that if you bolus fluids with dextrose, you can actually cause the foal to get more dehydrated because the sugar in the fluid acts as a diuretic. And so you have to be careful about the amounts of glucose that you're adding to the fluids. Um, I'm spoiled because I have a clinic with full 24-hour staff, um, and so we tend to use a lot of these IV pumps so that we can give it as a CRI, uh, which is obviously not always practical to do on the farm setting. Um, and then, as I mentioned, you know, we can, if we need more calories and we know that that foal is not going to be able to tolerate oral feeding for a long time, then I'll bump up the calories I'm delivering intravenously with uh, parenteral nutrition. There is, when you're using any of these fluids, even with dextrose, there is definitely an increased risk that they'll have a clot in their vein, thrombophlebitis, and that can get infected. And that's just because the bacteria love the nutrients in that fluid as well. And so proper, very judicious IV catheter care is really important. Um, and that's another reason that's not something I'm typically doing in a, a farm setting. So hydration-wise, um, there's lots of different types of fluids, and the amount and type that we use really depends on that foal's condition and the, the type of fluid that they're losing. So we decide what to use based on how, what their volume deficit is, how dehydrated they are, um, and then we are typically using either a, a balanced electrolyte solution, which is your LRS and your normal cell R, um, and you're providing both your maintenance fluid, so in other words, the fluid that that foal would be getting if it were normal and nursing properly, and then also replacing ongoing losses. So the easiest example of that is diarrhea, right? So they're losing a ton of fluid through the manure, and so you have to make sure you're replacing an adequate amount. Um, the other types of fluids we'll use, so foals, because they are designed to deal with this huge volume of milk, which is a very low sodium fluid, they don't tolerate a lot of sodium in, in IV fluids and they can get sodium overloaded. So we'll often use a low sodium containing fluid um, for those maintenance needs. There are also fluids that we generically call colloids, which is plasma and heta starch are the two most common forms. And that provides protein or oncotic support, which is what protein provides in your bloodstream to help hold the other fluid into your blood. So certain conditions, you tend to lose a lot of protein, diarrhea, again, being the most common example. Um, and so we'll, and the folds can become edematous as a result. Um, and so we'll use plasma for that as well as to support the immune system. Passive immunity, so this is our plasma here. So we want the IgG to be greater than 800. Uh, if the foal is less than 24 hours old, they can still absorb colostrum through the GI tract. If not, or if we want plasma for other reasons, um, then we're often giving them plasma to try to increase that IgG. If they are very sick, they can become catabolic and they actually metabolize the, the protein in the plasma. And so it may take more than one liter of high GAM plasma, which is what we typically use, to increase that IgG adequately. Um, so nursing care, really important in these sick foals. Um, keeping them in sternal recumbency is better for their lungs and it helps prevent the development of pneumonia. The umbilicus, um, there's debates about chlorhexidine or other um, disinfectants versus betadine. Betadine does allow the umbilicus to dry more. I am not a big fan of tincture of iodine because if it gets into the surrounding soft tissue structures, it can cause a lot of edema and sometimes you'll see foals that have this giant plaque of edema around their umbilicus um, and it's just irritation from that iodine. Thermoregulation, so these tools tend to be very poor at maintaining their own body heat. They, if they're septic, they can also have a fever, um, but it's really important that we, that we think about helping to keep them warm so they're also not expending a lot of calories to do that themselves. Um, pressure sores, if they're down for any amount of time, they can, are really, really prone to developing pressure sores on their hawks and 
hip in particular. Um, corneal ulcers, they tend to swing their head around and bash into the walls, and so we routinely stain their eyes every day to check for, check for ulcers. And they also just have decreased reflexes, so they're not protecting their eyes of, as well. And then perineal care, if they're down and getting messy, uh, we need to make sure that they're not developing sores there. All right, so I'm just going to move on and talk about some common abnormalities. This is a very brief overview of all of these things. They could all basically be their own individual lecture. Um, but the, one of the more common things that we see and that I get asked questions about is neonatal encephalopathy or dummy full syndrome or neonatal maladjustment syndrome. There's, there's a lot of different names for it, which just is really because we still have a pretty poor understanding of the pathogenesis of this disease or this syndrome. Um, so these foals can either be, the sort of classic dummy foal is usually normal at birth and then starts to develop signs within the 6 to 24 hour range, but it can progress very rapidly. Or they can be born abnormal. This is just a picture showing some scleral hemorrhage, which is a, a sign that that foal may have been stressed during delivery. So signs that we see, um, the primary one is just searching for the udder, so trying to nurse, nurse on the wall not going to the, you know, going, repeatedly going to the mare's elbow, uh, not knowing where they're supposed to be going and not latching on successfully. They typically have a lo complete loss or a decreased suckle reflex, and because of that, they are very prone to aspiration pneumonia if they are nursing or being bottle fed. Weakness, so they're often getting up less frequently than they should be and not moving around the stall. You'll often see abnormal breathing patterns. Some of the times they'll do, they'll breathe very rapidly and then almost hold their breath for a few seconds. It's called apneustic breathing, and that's because the respiratory centers in their brain are not working right. And sometimes you'll see voles that have this very, very low respiratory rate. And that helps us differentiate them from foals with pneumonia that tend to breathe very, very fast. And then their GI tract can also be affected, and these are the classic foals that don't tolerate large volumes of oral food because their GI tract can also have had hypoxic damage during birth, which is what we think happens to their, to their brains, that either in the mare or during delivery, they're not getting adequate oxygen to their brain, um, and they can have issues as a result. So the more sev severe form, these foals actually can start to have seizures. Um, and our, the top thing we want to make sure of if they are having seizures is that they don't have meningitis or an infection in their central nervous system, which can happen as a secondary problem to just being generally septic and getting bacteria in their bloodstream. So how do we treat this? So again, going back to sort of our core recipe, they definitely need antibiotics because they're at high risk for sepsis. They typically have a feeding tube in to provide nutrition, and I don't trust that they're not going to aspirate. Um, but I, we are judicious with the amounts, fluids, making sure they have passive immunity, and nursing care. Uh, in terms of any specific treatments, there really aren't any that are proven. There's a very, very long list of things that people try. Um, antioxidants, so vitamin C, vitamin DMSO, vitamin E selenium. We are in a selenium deficient area, um, so I do think it's appropriate to supplement foals. And then if they have evidence of hypoxia, then we are supplementing them with oxygen. They can develop gastric ulcers, so gastric protectants such as sucralfate might be warranted. And then to treat this respiratory depression that I mentioned, where they have a very low respiratory rate, and what happens with that is the carbon dioxide levels start to build up in their blood, and they have secondary issues because they are acidotic. And there's a medication called doxapram, which we can use to help stimulate that respiratory system. Um, people have also looked at using caffeine for this. We know based on a, um, a nice study that was done that doxapram is more effective, so I tend to use that. Um, and then if we think that they have cerebral edema, then we can use things like mannitol and hypertonic saline to try to get that excess fluid out of the brain. Controlling seizures, if they get to that stage, we're using diazepam or midazolam. Um, sometimes we'll, we'll use phenobarbital as well. Um, that's usually a fairly poor prognostic indicator if they start having seizures, though. So some of you may have uh, seen this or had this done at your farm. Um, this is this cool technique that's called the Madigan full squeeze technique, named after Don Madigan, who's an internist at UC Davis. The theory behind this 
um, which is, it's not proven yet, but they have shown that there are compounds called neurosteroids that the, circulate in the Mares system that help to keep the foal quiet when it's in utero. So the, the story goes that you, know, you don't want your foal galloping around inside the mare, and so these compounds help keep that foal a little bit quiet. And the thought is that when they're, what should happen when they're born is that the foal being squeezed by the pelvic canal should help with this transition to life outside the mare. Um, and that in some foals, that transition doesn't happen properly. And if you look at the levels of these compounds in some foals, they are higher than in other foals. The, they really haven't definitively shown this connection yet, but it's, it's a cool theory. Regardless, um, this technique involves squeezing the foal. It's almost like casting a, a calf. Uh, and you keep this rope on for 20 minutes. The foals, it does make the foals very sleepy. And so people have actually been using this to restrain them for plasma administration and things like that as well. So you don't have to use sedatives. Um, and in a subset of foals that are acting like dummy foals, this does seem to be very helpful uh, to help mimic that transition that was supposed to happen um, in the pelvic canal. Again, that's, that's the theory. Regardless, some of them, have, it has a profound effect, and they, when they were searching for the udder before, they get up and go and nurse and seem fixed. Um, the, sorry, let me just go back. The, one big contraindication is you really want to make sure your foal doesn't have fractured ribs before you do this, because you don't want to be squeezing on the fractured ribs. Um, so red flags for going back to dummy folds in general. So things that make me worried that we're going in the wrong direction are if they're becoming increasingly depressed or weak in spite of my treatments, if their carbon dioxide levels in their blood are increasing um, and with a low respiratory rate, if their GI tract isn't working as indicated by decreased manure output, gastric reflux, distended intestine on ultrasound, and then if they develop seizure activity. All right, so we're going to move on to sepsis. So these foals often present with just decreased nursing activity. Again, we have this scleral hemorrhage in the, in the top right. They can either have a fever or be hypothermic. They're often dehydrated and have entropion or the sunken eyes. They can have um, petechia, which are little ruptured blood vessels. The most obvious usually inside their ear. Um, uveitis, so this foal on the bottom right has a nice green eye, so that's from inflammation inside the eye. Sometimes they're lame because they can have septic joints associated with this. They may have respiratory signs associated with pneumonia. Um, again, GI signs, they have enteritis, diarrhea, and they can also have seizures, as I mentioned before, due to meningitis. Um, so just septic joints, that's a picture on the right there of the petechia in the ear. So these foals definitely need antibiotics, and I'm typically going for the IV broad-spectrum antibiotics. If I have that option, I want to do a blood culture first before starting those. And then again, nutrition, hydration, passive immunity, nursing care. Specific treatments, um, sometimes I will use small amounts of banamine um, to help decrease systemic inflammation. There are something called polymyxin B, which actually binds the endotoxin from gram-negative bacteria. It is extremely uh, harmful to the kidneys, though, so I want to make sure that that foal has normal renal function and is urinating before I use that. And then plasma is great for sepsis. Plasma, in addition to providing antibodies, has a lot of compounds in it that can help decrease inflammation and help combat endotoxemia. So red flags, again, increased weakness or recumbency, poor blood pressure. Um, so sometimes they'll have very cold limbs, cold ears. Uh, lack, so a lack of decrease in lactate. So I mentioned lactate at the beginning, and these foals typically will get them, sometimes will get them rehydrated, and so it's not a hydration standpoint, but their lactate levels are still not coming down as they should. Ongoing fever. So if I have them on broad-spectrum antibiotics and they're still having recurrent fevers, it makes me worry that we're not on the right drugs, and then development of septic joints. So prematurity or dismaturity, which generically I just think of as unreadiness for birth. So technically, a foal is premature if it's less than 320 days of gestation, and less than 300 days is usually considered not viable. There are reports of foals that have been treated aggressively um, that have lived that are less than 300 days, but it's usually a, a very costly endeavor with a 
guarded prognosis for an athletic horse. Uh, dismaturity would be if they're over 320 days, but they still have signs of prematurity. And again, this is going to depend on what the normal gestational length is for that mare as well. But those are the, the definitions. So clinical signs would be that they're underweight, um, have this sort of small stature. They're usually slow to stand and nurse. They often have a domed forehead and a fine silky hair coat. This fall on the right has all of those things. Uh, and the very floppy ears. Uh, they often have weak musculature and severe tendon laxity, often are dehydrated, have abnormal respiration, and GI signs, and abnormal mentation as well. Uh, my biggest concern about a premature foal is the development of their cuboidal bones. So that radiograph on the top there, those are the hawks of this foal that was born at 310 days of gestation, which is not that early, uh, but probably for that mare, it was way too early. And this foal, I mean, you can, on the lateral view there, there's just a little glimmer of calcification of that cuboidal bone. And the prognosis for athletic performance is very guarded because the risk of those bones crushing is very, very high. And managing these foals is a big challenge. Um, we'll sometimes apply casts, and you can imagine trying to deal with a, a foal that may have casts on all four limbs um, to try to immobilize those legs and decrease weight bearing because we want those bones to have a chance to calcify before they're bearing weight on them. Um, this is actually a foal that I saw here in Saratoga a few years ago that was born at 365 days gestation, so she went over, um, but it was, and it was a decent size foal. It's a little hard to appreciate, but it was born with this very, very long, rough hair coat, um, and it was weak, was a little bit slow to nurse, and then the placenta, it's a little bit hard to appreciate the colors, but the entire placenta was very thickened and brown, and um, the fetal fluid was just all thick, brown, nasty. Um, and this was a case of nocardiform placentitis, um, which is a bacteria that can cause thickening of the entire placenta, not just around the cervical star, as we see with other, some other types of placentitis. They aren't um, always, they don't always go late and they're not always dismature. It, that just happened to be the case in, with this foal. This foal did fine. We put it on SMZs and it did great. Um, so prematurity treatment, again, antibiotics. We do worry about, a lot about renal function, nutrition, all the, all the basics. Um, specific treatments, gastroprotectants, I, I, do, I use a lot of sucralfate to try to help um, prevent, protect the GI tract, oxygen therapy, cuboidal bone support, as I mentioned, is a really big one. Um, and so I said prognosis is guarded without placentitis. So if a mare has placentitis, this very interesting thing happens where the foals whole system is sort of stimulated to start developing early from that inflammation in the uterus. So they can actually be born prematurely with signs of placentitis and do much better because their lung maturation has been stimulated ahead of time and they're, they are more prepared to be living outside the mare than a foal that's born prematurely to a mare that has not had placentitis. So that's something I look closely at. And then I'm always, this is always a big conversation with the owners about what they're looking for. Are they looking for a racehorse? Are they looking, are they going to be okay with a pasture ornament? Because um, that makes a big difference in our, in our treatment decisions. So diarrhea. This is a foal that is very dehydrated. It has entropion. It's early in the morning for diarrhea pictures. But. Um, so treatment, again, our core recipe. These foals are really high risk for becoming septic. So. I like to get a blood culture. In addition to the antibiotics I already discussed, I will often add metronidazole because of the risk of clostridial diarrhea. Um, nutrition. So GI rest or preventing the folk from nursing can actually be really helpful in some cases, but we have to make sure we're still providing them with calories. So I do use a lot of parenteral nutrition with these foals. Um, hydration, these foals can have really severe electrolyte and acid-base derangement, so I'm checking those blood gases very frequently in, in really sick foals with diarrhea. And then one thing to keep in mind at the farm is that if you have a foal with diarrhea and you see that they're at the mare's water bucket incessantly, 
either raise that bucket or add electrolytes to the water because they can make their sodium levels dangerously low if they're drinking too much water. So they're, they get dehydrated, they're appropriately stimulated to drink, but then they kind of go too far and get way too much water without salt um, and can actually make themselves very neurologic if that sodium gets low enough. Again, passive, passive immunity, really important. Um, they tend to get a lot of ulcerations as well. So specific treatments, um, anti-diarrheal agents, there's, there's a whole slew of them. Um, Biosponge uh, does bind to clostridial toxins. Pepto, Pepto paste or suspension can be helpful as an anti-secretory agent, and there's, there's, a, long, there's a long list. Um, gastroprotectants to, to prevent ulcers, sucralfate and gastroguard. Probiotics, so there's a debate about probiotics. Um, the thought is that they're good in theory and that we really want to get that the bacterial balance in the GI tract is really important. We just seem to not quite know yet what kind and how much of what kind of bacteria to use. And there was actually a study done looking at foals and giving them probiotics. And they, they unfortunately saw an increased incidence of diarrhea with the probiotic that they were using, which was not a commercially available probiotic. They actually had made their own. But it was a little bit discouraging. So I think there's actually a lot of very active research on the um, bacterial balance in the GI tract. And so I think we'll, we'll know more about that soon. These foals do tend to be a little bit crampy. Um, so I am using judicious amounts of banamine with them as well. So red flags, again, increase depression and weakness. If the diarrhea becomes bloody, that makes me very concerned about clostridial diarrhea, which can be rapidly fatal. Um, colic and definitely checking closely for septic joints. So <clears throat> those are the, the four things I'm going to spend the most time talking about. And I just want to point out that there's this huge overlap. And foals really tend to not like to just have one problem. They like to have multiple things going on at the same time. Uh, and so there's this big overlap we see with all these diseases. And almost all of them just start with a foal that's a little bit quiet and not nursing well. So my challenge is always to try to figure out which disease process, processes are going on and address all of them concurrently. Um, I'm briefly talk about NI. So these, this is where there's an incompatibility between the mares uh, and the foals' red blood cell types, and antibodies from the colostrum destroy the red blood cells of the, cell, of the foal and make them anemic. Um, so these foals are completely normal at birth because they haven't ingested that colostrum yet. Typically, they have good colostral intake and uh, adequate IgG because it's the antibodies from the colostrum that cause the problem. So they then begin to develop signs of anemia, usually eight hours to four days after birth. And how quickly it develops depends on the dose of antibodies that they've gotten from the colostrum, usually. Um, they're lethargic. They're not nursing as well. You'll often notice that they'll stand there with an increased respiratory rate uh, because they're trying to circulate more, more air, so do the anemia. And then eventually they develop icterus, or these yellow mucous membranes. So I think it's actually easier to see on the sclera of their eye. Um, and then the, the gums can change as well. But that usually happens farther into the course of disease. So again, our, our core recipe, antibiotics, nutrition, hydration, uh, usually their IgG is not the problem. Uh, specific therapies might be oxygen therapy to help support them when they're anemic, and then blood transfusions. So blood transfusions are definitely indicated depending on what that foal's PCV is and how quickly it's, it's dropping and what the foal looks like clinically. So usually we're using anywhere from half to two liters of whole blood. We do know that more blood is not better, um, and you can actually cause fatal iron toxicity by giving them too much blood, uh, because there's tons of iron in the, the red blood cells that you're transfusing them with, and so they can have go into liver failure down the road from that, which is not ideal. Uh, immunosuppressants, so steroids, are sometimes used to try to help decrease that immune reaction between the antibodies and the red blood cells. And then I think a really important basic thing is just to avoid stress. So these foals, I don't like to turn them out. You're, if they're running around, they're just going to increase their body's demand for oxygen. And even shipping, you know, depending on what that foal's doing, sometimes we have this debate of, okay, 
should it come into the clinic or are we going to push it over the edge by shipping it depending on where it's coming from. So red flags, because of those red blood cells getting broken down, there's a compound called bilirubin um, that is in, from the red blood cells and those levels can get very high and if they get high enough, they can actually become very neurologic um, as a result of that bilirubin being high. And that's a very challenging thing to treat. Um, and then what I'm looking for is what their PCV is doing. Is it dropping very quickly or is it staying stable? And I look at lactate a lot as well in these foals because that's telling me how much oxygen they're getting to their tissues. So uh, moving on to, to straining things. Um, so just wanted to point out the difference in posture between a foal that's straining to defecate and a foal that's straining to urinate. Is it something people sometimes get confused? Uh, if they're straining to urinate, then we worry about uroperitoneum or ruptured bladder um, or ruptured umbilicus. So this is a picture, uh, ultrasound picture. You can actually see the tear in the bladder there. It's usually not quite that obvious, but um, sometimes it is. And then if, hopefully you can appreciate the foal on the right has this very distended, sort of pendulous looking abdomen. So this tends to happen, it's more common in colts, um, and it's thought to be primarily due to trauma during delivery. Again, antibiotics, they're gonna be at risk for getting septic. We definitely wanna avoid things that are gonna be harmful to the kidneys, because their kidney values are often already increased. Nutrition, hydration, so we are careful with our fluids here because we don't wanna, their potassium levels can get dangerously high if they have urine in their abdomen. Um, so we're using fluids targeted at decreasing that potassium level. Passive immunity, nursing care again. So specific treatment. Um, you can place a urinary catheter to try to prevent further accumulation of urine in the abdomen and to relieve pressure. To confirm our diagnosis, we'll get a sample of the fluid from the abdomen and we measure the creatinine of that fluid versus the creatinine, which is one of the primary kidney values in the blood. It should be higher in the abdomen than the blood. And then really the ultimate treatment for these foals is surgery to repair, repair that tear. Meconium impaction, so here's our foal straining to defecate. They're often mildly colicky. Um, and that's typically happening within the first 24 hours of birth. I use ultrasound a lot to identify the meconium in these foals. Uh, sometimes there's so much gas distension that you can't see it, but usually back in the inguinal region, you can actually see the meconium. It has this sort of um, very bright appearance. And, and if you can see, there, there's multiple loops of intestine there um, with sort of a, what we call a mixed echogenicity, meaning some parts of it are dark, some parts of it are very bright. But it can be variable depending on how dense the meconium is. Radiographically, we'll often see this tremendous gas dissension in the intestine in front of the meconium. And then we can usually see meconium back in the pelvic canal. So these foals, I'm, uh, again, antibiotics, nutrition. So I usually try to not let them nurse for a little while because if uh, nothing is moving through and they're at risk for reflux and aspiration, especially if they're colicky. Um, banamine to help them be a little bit more comfortable. And then I like to pass the tube, make sure they don't have any reflux building up in their stomach, especially if they're colicky. I'll sometimes give them um, some oral laxatives if I think that things are moving through enough for those to get where they need to go. So um, two to four ounces of mineral oil, two to four ounces of milk magnesia. Um, and then I like to use what's called a retention enema. Um, so we'll usually start out just trying a basic um, soapy water or fleet enema. You do have to be careful about giving too many fleet enemas because they have a large amount of phosphorus in them and you can actually overload the foals with phosphorus. Um, so this is, picture on the right is us doing an acetylcysteine retention enema. So you basically take a combination of acetylcysteine and water and sometimes some bicarb and put it in rectally with a Foley catheter and clamp the catheter off. And I like to elevate their, their butt and let it sit there for 15, 20 minutes. And that acetylcysteine, which smells like perm fluid, uh, actually dissolves the meconium. Uh, it can be really, really successful. And what I do is I sedate them for this depending on how healthy and feisty the foal is. They need varying amounts of sedatives. 
I also, if they're systemically healthy, will give them just a very small amount of buscopan, which is an antispasmodic drug, because that really helps stop the straining against that catheter. Uh, and I find you can keep them down and quiet for much longer. And while they're down and sedated, I give them fluids at the same time to correct their hydration. Um, this was just a, a double whammy sort of night. This was a foal that came in for meconium impaction, and then while he was there, the mare decided to flip her colon. So the mare went to surgery. Well, we, we fixed the foal's meconium impaction, but it was, it's not really what you want to see. So. <laughs> um, Rarely we will have to take those foals to surgery, but we try to do absolutely everything we can to treat them medically. So rib fractures, um, the, the, you can see this horse, this foal has a caved in chest here on the right. And then the, what we're really trying, what we worry about and are trying to avoid with rib fractures is fatal hemorrhage due to trauma from those ends, sharp ends of the rib, puncturing things they shouldn't. This is the heart here with a big bruise on it. Obviously, in a fold, it didn't make it. Um, I like to put, I put signs on the folds showing where the broken ribs are so that everyone handling them knows exactly where that fractured rib is and where to stay away from. Um, and my primary, my favorite diagnostic for diagnosis, if, you know what I mean, sorry, ultrasound. <laughs> uh, this is an ultrasound image on the right of a fractured rib. The sort of vertical bright white line is the costochondral junction, and the fractures almost always occur just above the costochondral junction, and hopefully you can appreciate those two um, fragment ends there. And those are actually very minimally displaced. That's about a half centimeter difference between those two ends. Uh, so depending on the location of the fractures and how many ribs are fractured, sometimes we can, often we can treat these foals conservatively, so just keeping them in a stall for four weeks. That's if they're not displaced and if the ribs are caudal to rib five. And single rib fractures are much less of a problem. Um, on the other hand, if ribs two through five are involved, those are the ribs that live right over the heart, so they're a much larger concern. Um, and if they have multiple rib fractures in a row, then those, all those fractures are less stable. So if you imagine there's one fracture and you've got two normal ribs on either side, that actually helps stabilize the fractured rib, whereas if you have a whole row of them, they tend to be a lot more likely to displace and, and cause problems. So if, they, yeah, so if we have all those displaced ribs and we're worried about hemorrhage, then uh, we can take them to surgery to repair those ribs. Contracted tendons, really, really common, a huge range, as I'm sure you guys know, of, of severity. Um, we use a lot of oxytetracycline, which is an antibiotic, which also has this magic side effect of helping to relax those tendons. Um, really important, though, to be aware that it can cause kidney damage. In my experience, foals that are systemically healthy and nursing great and just have a contracted tendon tolerate huge volumes of tetracycline for long periods of time and don't have issues. It's the foals that aren't nursing well, have any other issue going on. And once they get a little bit dehydrated and then you give them tetracycline, you can put them into acute renal failure. Um, so we, I like to monitor their creatinine levels periodically if they require multiple doses in particular. Um, the key is you can't just give them tetracycline and walk away. They have to also be bearing weight on that leg to help stretch that tendon out. So we're using, we use a lot of splints and casts um, to try to keep that um, tension on that tendon, even if they're not bearing weight on it, and physical therapy as well. So we'll go in there and just do sort of passive range of motion and try to stretch those tendons out periodically. Um, controlled exercise, again, you need them to be bearing weight, trying to stretch that tendon out. Pain medication is really key, especially if you've got splints on and, and you're putting a lot of tension. They, it's, it's painful, and then they don't want to nurse, and then they can have issues because of that as well. But almost all those pain medications can also cause kidney damage, which is another reason we check those values. Um, this was a full, it was a, we actually had to take the mare to C-section um, because the foal didn't want to come out due to its severely contracted tendons in both front legs. Um, this was, that was as far as the leg would bend at birth, um, and with oxytetracycline and splinting, the foal ended up doing quite well. Um, this is a kind of a gross picture, but uh, just, I always 
it's really important to keep in mind that these foals can have some very severe congenital abnormalities, and that's going to make a big difference in how aggressive we want to treat them and how much money we want to put into them. This is a very severe um, cleft palate on the left-hand side, so there's basically no soft palate there at all. Um, not a good prognosis. There are some, some surgical techniques described to repair cleft palates, um, but especially with one this large, it's not, not a good deal. Um, this foal at the top was a dystocia that came in, and when the veterinarian put his hand in to feel the foal, he actually felt the foal's brain, which was on the outside of its head. Um, it also had multiple contracted tendons. It was, this was about two months, it was about two months early, um, but it was not coming out without assistance due to the contracted tendon. So it had multiple abnormalities in one foal. It was a foal with scoliosis, um, with the bent back there, and then that's a case, severe case of rhinos on the right. We'll see some very mild cases of rhinos, which they can, can do okay, but they can have long-term issues with their teeth not aligning. Um, so just hopefully one of my take-home messages is that early intervention is really key to a positive outcome. Um, so the earlier we can get these foals treated, um, the better chance we have of saving them. So this foal on the left here, we nicknamed Noah. He was born, he was 30 days premature, also had NI and clostridium diarrhea. The mayor had placentitis. Um, he had like every, everything known to man. He fortunately had owners that were willing for him to just go on and be a pet because he had no, no cuboidal bones. Um, and he's still, he's doing great as a pasture ornament. Um, this foal on the right uh, was a case of salmonella. Came in very, very septic, horrible diarrhea. The mayor actually had salmonella as well, and that's him um, getting broken. And he actually just raced two weeks ago. So that was cool. Okay, those are my boys. <laughs> Does anyone have questions at this point? Yeah. Yes. Is there a protocol to um, differentiate between infection versus inflammation and infectious, like a equine herpes virus 4 or a non-infectious like asthma or uh, allergies? No. No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm actually going to talk about SAA. So you're just and picking up infections then? Yeah. yeah. So uh, I'm going to talk about SAA in the rotococcus lecture. Um, I have some, some slides of that. The, the thought is that it could be better for, it could be more specific to infection versus inflammation. Um, so you may have higher levels, but the thing, the really key thing is to remember is it's not differentiating what type of disease process is going on at all. So in certain circumstances, I think it would be helpful as a, a screening test. Um, you know, in addition, I, I'm not a huge, I don't rely on it by itself. Um, but again, I'm fortunate because I can run a CBC and a fibrinogen at the same time, so I'm using it as part of the database. Um, but it's never telling you specifically what disease process you're dealing with. You can just say, okay, it's, it's high. Um, so it's, the manufacturer would have you believe that it's extremely helpful. Um, I'm a little bit more skeptical, as you can probably tell, but I'll talk about it from a screening standpoint with, with rotococcus. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Top three things you wish your breed... Top three things you wish your breeding farms on the outskirts of your service area, it, what, what you want them to have on hand? Oh, wow. That's a good question. Um, a trailer. <laughs> I'm serious. <laughs> um, I think it's, it's a huge, it's, there's nothing more frustrating than a horse needing to get shipped somewhere and it, you know, taking hours to get transportation. Um, so I'm, I'm not a believer in oxygen therapy for every foal that is born. I don't think that's necessary. But I think that the, uh, having oxygen, having a small portable oxygen tank can be life-saving um, for some foals. Um, what's a third one? What's that? Heat lamps, yeah, it's a good, it's a good one. Um, I mean, especially these early foals in, in this area. They, I get foals shipped in that are literally like ice cubes coming off the, coming off the trailers. It, gets, it can be really hard on them. Um, a, a thermometer, I'm going to say also, because 
as I'll talk about in the next lecture, I think, uh, and that's not so much in the, the immediately postpartum period, but I think that monitoring foals' temperatures daily is the most important thing we can be doing to, to check up on our foals.